I'm very happy that uh, Jonas Stahl is here today uh, to talk about his work because we had a conversation about a long time with several people actually for, of us with him uh, when he was involved in Occupy uh, Amsterdam and uh, later with his work and then uh, in Berlin Jonas was organizing the New World Summit about which I will not talk much uh, now because he will um, but uh, it was a very impressing um, a very impressive congress, a very impressive summit uh, that, that I really thought uh, will bring something here which uh, other, others don't touch. In a way, it would have fitted yesterday uh, quite well in context also of Joanna's blog uh, into the questions of legal, illegal, what is accepted, what is not accepted by law and society. Um, so maybe it's also a bit an extension into another field uh, in this direction. Um, so while people still are coming in, Jonas, I give you the floor. Thanks a lot for being here. Ah, yeah, and you, Jonas uh, is a bit, a bit sick, so uh, we are very thankful, and uh, we will put the microphone very loud so that we can hear you well. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Florian. <clears throat> I didn't speak all day yesterday to save my voice for today, but if you hear me coughing or spitting out cough drops, or then you know the context. Um, Okay, my lecture today is entitled History of Art According to the Resistance. I will start, I hear there's a lot of echo, so maybe if I speak too fast, you let me know, it's okay? Okay. Um, I'll start with a very short introduction as, the, uh, as a, a warming up in the first 10 minutes, give a little bit of context to what I try to indicate through this title. Wow, thank you. Oh, no. this will be a good morning. And then I'll introduce some of my um, some of my projects. History is written by the victors. The world as we know it, geographically, politically, economically, is based on monopolies of power. And the question I will address today is how, through the use of art, we can oppose these monopolies and propose new narratives that allow us to write and act upon unwritten, unrepresented histories. The histories that could have defined, defined our present, but have somehow turned in a form of suppressed knowledge by the monopolies that define the current global political order. The question that the title of my presentation addresses is how we can redefine the meaning of art once we would contextualize it, once it is contextualized within these alternative suppressed histories. How does the concept of art change when we have, to ch when we have the chance to perceive its historical exploration on the issue of representation, once it is placed in a different ideological context? We are used to think of the artist as the one who is representing through its work. But how is the role of the art, of the artist, himself represented differently when we propose new historical contexts in which we can define its function? In other words, how would the history of art look like according to the resistance? The current world order, I'm sorry, the images are very dark, I can't, I can't help it. The current world order has found a collective dogma in the concept of democracy. There are hardly any regimes or political parties today that do not call themselves democratic or would ever, ever publicly state that they somehow oppose human rights, freedom, diversity, equality. The democratic vocabulary, the concepts that we attribute to democracy, has turned into a generic dogma. It obscures rather than puts into practice democracy in an emancipatory sense. In Japanese, the word democracy, as you see it here, only exists as an ism, as democratism, making democratism simply one of the many isms that are currently ideologically available, if you would want to put it in a bit of a cynical manner. And I propose to use the word democratism as a first differentiation from the word democracy. To make clear that when we use these concepts, democracy, freedom, equality, diversity, 
that we are actually meaning different things from different ideological contexts. Rather than being a neutral framework facilitating a variety of different ideologies, democratism defines democracy as an ideological framework in itself. The term democratism indicates the transition of the constantly self-reassessing principles of democracy, so I mean that democracy in an emancipatory sense always questions its own monopolies of power. Democratism indicates its transition into a stagnant, non-reflexive ideology of administration and governance. And some of the, what is most important <clears throat> in understanding democratism as a series of monopolies, the, the monopolies that democratism upholds are the following. The monopolies on violence, the monopoly on representation, monopoly on information, and the monopoly on history. Through the Spanish Indignados protests, the worldwide Occupy movement, the modern media initiative, IMI, and WikiLeaks, through the old green and the new pirate parties, I believe we are witnessing what can best be described as an international democratization movement that on a variety of levels opposes these monopolies of democratism. In opposition to the monopolies on representation, violence, information, and history, this, this movement articulates, articulates a series of demands. This begins with the demand to organize ourselves as political beings. Behind me, an image of a general, well, what's left of an image, we can better say, what's left of an image of a general assembly during uh, Occupy Amsterdam. This is really problematic. If somehow we can have the image slightly more... Sorry? Oh, really? Better than me? Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, it begins with the demand, the demand from the international democratization movement to organize, organize ourselves as political beings. Meaning that the people involved in this movement refuse to outsource the process in which we shape our world to unknown others. But we take it as a political task to do this ourselves. This demand entails the democratization of our politics, of our economy, the democratization of our ecology, and the democratization of the public domain. It is a demand to, dem to explore the principles of an egalitarian society. That is not the same. Egalitarian society is not the same as a so society where everybody has a natural right to everyone's belongings, or a society where there is no such thing as a private sphere or intimacy. The demands of the worldwide democratization movement rather take the shape of temporal public spaces, where the meaning of this concept of what an egalitarian society could be is explored through various collectives, through protests, squares, as well as through virtual spaces. These are platforms where we do not outsource our vote, in Dutch, vote literally means voice, but we attempt to shape our voice ourselves. This concept of democracy as a movement of political beings not tied to single leaders or dogmas, but through a fidelity, through a loyalty to the principles of egalitarianism as a shared emancipatory project is what I call fundamental democracy. And it is a concept that is irreconcilable with democratism. It is from this differentiation of the concept of democracy into democracy, into democratism versus fundamental democracy that an ideological battlefield unveils itself. A battlefield that is the result of countering the monopolies of democratism with the demands of fundamental democracy. And what I would like to introduce to you today are a series of my projects that explore this ideological battlefield. They are projects that are the results of collaborations with other artists, with politicians, with political parties, and non-parliamentary political organizations. For each of these projects, I will address a specific aspect 
of the monopolies on, of democratism and attempt to contribute to the exploration of what could be considered fundamental democracy. Um, I will discuss about three projects. The fourth project, Florian already mentioned it, will be the New World Summit. I'm very happy to have Yunus Buadi present behind me on the couch uh, with who I realized that project. He will uh, introduce part of it later in the lecture today. Maybe as a first example of where this concept of democratism and fundamental democracy clash is a protest that took place one year ago uh, in The Hague, in the Netherlands, where the parliament is located. And it was a protest that was initiated by the artist community, but it existed of a variety of people from Dutch society, who protested the enormous cuts on the artistic infrastructure that are cu currently taking place in the Netherlands and that have caused the end of many of our art institutions, mostly contemporary art institutions. And what's interesting here is that you see a clash between the protest that was the result of what was called a march of civilization, a march that took uh, place from different cities in the Netherlands where people walked all the way to The Hague to protest these uh, cultural budget cuts. Here you see what is a potential basis for an exploration of fundamental democracy and the moment it clashes with the authorities of democratism. So what we see here is, a, is what starts as a peaceful protest, as a spontaneous protest, as a non-violent protest, that after a few hours was broken down by the police. And this was a very curious event because the right to spontaneous protest in the Netherlands has, is constitutionally grounded quite strongly. So a few weeks later, after much critique of the use of riot police to break down these protesters, questions were asked in the municipality by mainly the progressive and left-wing parties. Why was it necessary to break down a protest of artists, elderly, who oppose the budget cuts in a non-violent manner? And the answer that came was very, I think, was incredibly interesting. I mean, protests, there are always, there are, today they are not very not always as interesting, um, formally speaking, form-wise speaking. But the answer to this protest was, was very interesting. The mayor said, as an answer to the questions of these political parties, the reason why we broke down this protest is not because the people were protesting. Of course they have the right to protest. But the space around Dutch Parliament is a commercial space. So there are shops located there. And because of this protest, it was impossible for people to go to the shops that were located around the parliament. So it's not a problem, it was a problem of two rights. The rights to consume on one hand and the rights to protest on the other. And it became apparent which protest, prevail, which right prevailed above um, the other. Making it also very complicated because around the Dutch parliament there are nothing but commercial spaces. So where do we end up once this? So yes, we have the right to protest, but there is no place to protest. This, I thought, was a very interesting uh, um, confrontation with one of the main, one of the key monopolies of democratism today, namely the, mon the monopoly on violence. The image you see here is an image, is a, is a, is an, is a documentation of a project that came as a response to this specific protest. It's a project that's called Social Experiment or that's organized by a group called Social Experiment. It exists of, apart from me, of four other artists, Klaas van Gorkum, Iratje Gajo, uh, Wouter Osterholt and Elke Uitentuis. And the basic principle of the group Social Experiment is to create situations, to create experiments in which democratic concepts are investigated through group processes. And what you see here is one of these first experiments, one of these first situations in which a group of artists and art students during three days were trained by the police, the Dutch Police Academy. Uh, two teachers, one uh, had his history from the riot police and one from the regular police. So the focus of the police training for us was how to understand, how to comprehend the texture 
of society through which the monopoly on violence is maintained. How, as artists, if we want to intervene in that, how can we get the knowledge necessary, the materials necessary, to oppose these? What was very interesting to find out, here the training starts, during these three days, is that the police academy, you would think is a state institution, but it's actually not. It's a privatized institution. Uh, to have a three-day training costs about 14,000 euros, so the knowledge through which the monopoly on violence is maintained is, of, is incredibly expensive. In this case, we were capable of convincing uh, one of a Dutch, a Dutch art school in the Netherlands, that's the location that you see, to um, finance it for us. But this might be interesting when it comes to this uh, uh, conflict that we experienced at the parliament, the clash between the protesters and the consumers, that there's something, uh, there, there's a specific importance, specific value when it comes to this kind of privatized, um, this privatized freedom. The focus point of the training, what you see here is uh, the first day of the training, an introduction to the juridical framework in which violence can be used by the police and by the riot police. Uh, our task was to understand this juridical framework, to analyze a situation in which a violent violence occurs, to isolate and, and then question, interrogate these the subjects causing this violent situation, um, and through this, this was very interesting, obtain the truth. And obtaining the truth was literally uh, mentioned by the police trainers uh, as such. So uh, after a, a, a training of theory, what you see here is the first um, exploration of uh, uh, interrogating subjects. Of course, during the three days, there were collective uh, dinners. We lived and worked together with the two police trainers. Uh, and one of the police trainers uh, who had obviously interrogated many, many subjects uh, was, became the subject we had to interrogate, which was one of the most difficult uh, tasks I, I, I have had to confront as an, um, as an artist. Because what is interesting is that there's an exchange during these three days that takes place. We are being trained, we are the trainer subject, but of course these trainers, of which one, the man, the enormously large man you see sitting behind the table, who is the director of the police um, academy, we are, of course, also investigating them. We are their subjects of training, but they are our subjects of investigation. They are the architects of the monopoly on violence in our society. And this exchange, I think, was very interesting. This constant negotiation, knowing also of one another that we would, that we would usually never share the same space. This group of uh, trainees was actually the group that a few, only a few months later would constitute um, the artist slash activist group Artists in Occupy Amsterdam and would then be confronted with exactly the people that trained us only a few weeks before. More monopolies to discuss. We started with the monopoly on violence. I want to speak of the monopoly of, on representation. I will do this by introducing the project Allegories of Good and Bad Government, a collaboration between an artist, Hans van Houwelingen, and the politician, Labour Party Elderman of Arts and Culture, Carolien Gerels, a project we organized in W139 in Amsterdam. What you see here is a space in which four artists, four politicians engaged with art, and four artists engaged with politics lived and worked together for four days in what we called an alternative Parliament. We are talking about politicians from the Labour Party, social liberals uh, from the Green Party, Liberal Party, and artists Nicolien van Haarskamp, Jean van Heeswijk, Hans van Houdingen, and myself. And the collective aim was by living and working together in this space, we called it an alternative parliament, as we attempted to create a space that did not only um, focus on the exchange in um, in words, but also in the physical experience of living together, of sleeping together, of eating together, working together on all varieties uh, of levels. The collective aim was to explore whether there could be such a thing today as a common agenda, a collective agenda between artists and politicians, that, in, that both, in different ways, today co-create, shape, represent our society. 
Important, of course, about this alternative parliament is that the conditions this time are set by artists, by designers, by architects, in this case in collaboration with Meta Haven and architect Paul Kuipers. And the intention of the project, the goal we tried to articulate for ourselves, is how to break the exclusive right of representation of artists and politicians, both. How to also democratize their very privileged role in society as those who give shape, as those who visualize democratic ideals. The conversation during these four days uh, was not public. It was instead uh, transcribed by clerks from the government who normally make notes when there are debates in parliament. And we gave them the task to write out all of our conversations during these four days, but without ever mentioning who said what at which given time. So it became one continuous text that was uh, visible on the internet and in the front of the exhibition space where we were located, which you see here. So people could, the, the conversation in that sense was public, but not public in the sense that the words of each participant could be identified as that of a politician or as that of an artist. We borrowed this form from a wonderful conversation between Gilles Deleuze and um, journalist Claire Parnet, who made a book, it's called Dialogue, dialogues in which they speak together without mentioning who says what at what given time. And what is very interesting is that at a certain moment, the one who questions, the one who answers, that these voices start to mingle, and at a certain moment you do not know if it's two people speaking, a hundred people speaking, all of these voices mix together. The voice of one becomes the voice of another. And this, in the case of the artists and the politicians, was highly interesting. In these four days, we took responsibility for each other's voice, for each other's ideas. And the text that resulted from these four days was uh, collectively signed as our collective manifesto. Here you see um, the Allegories of Good and Bad government project, one of these four days that we were working together. So the value of the experiment is exactly this, the ex how to explore a model of representation in which the disciplines of art and politics become interchangeable, but also in which democracy is no longer valued through this idea of representing somebody else's voice, but by taking responsibility over someone else's voice. Highly interesting for us also is that W139, those who have ever been in Amsterdam know that this exhibition space is located in the center of the city. And only a few months later, we suddenly saw the tents that we used to create private spaces for the politicians and artists in the exhibition space suddenly manifest outside on the uh, square in, uh, in front of that space because the Occupy movement uh, had uh, arrived. Um, manifested itself in the center of Amsterdam, which was, of course, a very interesting, for us, a very in interesting experience to see how a fragment uh, of our uh, project was suddenly became part of a much bigger and much more important uh, social experiment, collective social experiment. Uh, this is the tent uh, of the group artists in Occupy Amsterdam. I mentioned it before. Tomorrow night, I'll be part of the Occupy uh, panel together with Urok Sierhan, and we will introduce the uh, group and its goals and its function of about 30 artists who worked in the Occupy protests in Amsterdam. Here you see the inside of the tent. How am I with time? Half an hour. So, next monopoly. The monopoly on information. What you see here is the logo of Nopent, a project that was the immediate result of a collaboration with one of the politicians, one of the four politicians that we collaborated with in the allegories of good and bad government project that I just introduced to you. This politician you see here, it's one of, was one of the best dressed politicians of the Netherlands, Mariko Peters, representative of the Green Party. And the allegories of good and bad government project was structured as such that during these four days, each participant proposed a case to discuss during half a day. So during the four days, every day, one case by a politician, one case by an artist was discussed that specifically, art specifically addressed an issue when it came to the relationship between art and politics. And the case that Mariko Peters, this is a Dutch newspaper, don't try to read it, the case that Mariko Peters tried to propose was the case, was a, a law that she was writing at the time. And the law um, is supposed to become the new freedom of information law in the Netherlands. The freedom of information laws are meant 
to give citizens, journalists, the possibility to control their government. That when we ask documents when it comes to the production of specific laws or of specific jurisdiction, that we have the right to see these documents, these laws address or attempt to create what could be called a transparent government. The existing law of the, in the Netherlands is one that is haunted by a permanent state of exception, which is of course that of public safety, meaning that any document that government considers of any potential danger for someone or some group or some interest in society when it comes to the general safety can be upheld by the government meaning that it is almost impossible for uh, journalists to get important documents freed, uh, for example, when it came to the par our participation, the participation of the Dutch government in the war in Iraq. It took two and a half years to get a document published that uh, defined our, um, that, that um, document the motivations for our participation in this war, which then also were partly censored. So even when the documents came out, then still there is a kind of uh, possibility polit the pol politicians have to, ministers have to erase certain information. The new freedom of information law of Peters tries to turn that situation around. She proposed in this law to have all information that is produced by government to be public, permanent through a digital database, slightly similar to the uh, current freedom of information law in Norway and slightly similar to what IMI, the... Um, uh, International Modern Media Initiative in Iceland is trying to propose. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, that this law actually passed only a few months ago. But the interesting thing is that even when these laws are put into, into practice, that government has a, let's say, that govern govern governments have a, a tendency to produce these databases these public databases, in such a way that somehow the information stays as obscured as it was before the law as once it becomes part of this public database, leaving it still to professionals, to journalists, to find the information needed. And our idea, the reason why we started collaborated with uh, Michael Peters, me and uh, design collective Metahaven, um, was to think of what this public database uh, could become in the terms of a digital parliament. This is what we call what the nullpunt project, nullpunt means a zero point, point zero uh, project tries to uh, bring about. What we designed while Mariko Peters was working as a politician on the development of this law, we also immediately started developing the public digital database that was supposed to put this law into practice. This was the, the value, the great value of this di direct dialogue with a politician who does something very particular because as a politician she tries to produce a law that actually puts her position as, uh, that breaks down her own power as a politician. By making all information of government permanently pu public with no state of exception, she actually reduces her own role as a politician as the one who has the sole right to understand what these documents are about. The slogan of our Nullpunt database of the digital program we proposed Highlight, comment, amplify. And what you see here is the general uh, layout of um, what we call a crossover between WikiLeaks and social media. Meaning that when the new freedom of information law is put into practice, a user, any citizen of the Netherlands can subscribe to Nopunt, and make a profile, make clear what kind of information they wish to follow, they wish to receive. Um, and this then leaks automatically daily in their inbox. So controlling government becomes something not exclusively meant for uh, journalists or other professionals, but becomes something part of daily life, becomes something that is that you do somehow in between reading the online New York Times and checking your Facebook, there is no point. Controlling government, being part, being a political being, acting as a political being is not something that is that is excluded to voting once in four years. It's part of daily life practice. Highlight, comment, amplify means once these documents uh, arrive in the inbox, it's very easy to uh, highlight documents, to share the highlight, the, the parts of documents highlighted with 
other users and to amplify it through other social media. So Nullpunt is connected to a variety of other social media, making it very easy to distribute knowledge gained from this digital database. Its slogan, you see that we have a bit of a, um, let's say, schizophrenic way of using Dutch and English all the time through each other. It's because we also wo work together with, um, with Imi, the Icelandic colleagues. So sometimes we communicate the project in Dutch, sometimes in English. The slogan is um, towards a democracy without secrets. Final project. We discussed the monopoly on violence, the monopoly on representation, the monopoly on information. And the last monopoly I want to discuss is that on history. And I want to do that through the project New World Summit, a series, a series of what I call alternative parliaments. I use the same term for allegories of good and bad government, I use the term digital parliament for Nulpunt. A series of alternative parliaments that are, are meant for political and juridical representatives of organizations placed on so-called international terrorist lists. Um, every country today in the world has an international terrorist list, meaning uh, lists where organizations are placed upon who are considered to be state threats, and the consequences are very severe. Uh, among others, bank accounts are frozen, travel bans are put into immediate place. One is actually put outside of democracy through these lists, you could say. The first of this, um, in this alternative parliaments of the New World Summit took place in the Sophienzeel in Berlin during the 7th Berlin um, Biennial. The next editions will be in India, Netherlands, Belgium. What is interesting about the organizations on these international terrorist lists, we invited about 100 of them, or at least tried to contact, but then it becomes, the question is who answers, of course. Um, in essence, in the alternative parliament, we, we invite all organizations today placed on the international terrorist list. What you see here is a digital drawing of the first of alternative parliaments that we developed um, for the project. And the, images that you see, the flags that you see, are the flags of these organizations, of these banned organizations, organizations placed on the international terrorist list. And here you see the actual um, parliament located in the Sophienzeele in Berlin. These organizations, in a way, they literally, physically embody the limits of democratism, one might say. That what our existing system cannot uphold the suppressed knowledge I talked about in my introduction. Um, that makes it possible to maintain the different monopolies that I try to introduce to you today. From the perspective of fundamental democracy, of course, this is an unacceptable paradox. If democracy exists, it exists without limits. That is exactly the core of an emancipatory concept of democracy, or it does not exist at all. There is no democracy with limits. There is no limit at democracy. We are confronted with our own limits when we try to enact democracy, but the concept of democracy in an egalitarian, emancipatory sense is limitless. It cannot be anything else. So what the New World Summit tries to do is to act upon that democratic promise, and it tries to use the negative state of exception with which these organizations are confronted when they are placed outside of democracy with what you could say the positive state of exception of the arts. As an artist, having been confronted very often with the, um, with the juridical system, with the law, it has, been, it has occurred to me that the, the place of art in the law is somehow not, is not yet defined, uh, allows for a space, allows for a questioning, and that you cannot find in many other disciplines. So the question of this project is how to connect this positive state of exception at surface of this negative state of exception. And a really simple example, here you see the first day of the summit, but let me just get back to this one. A very simple example um, was the presence of the flags of these organizations. There's one of the flags, that of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, better known as the PKK, 
that in, 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 in the public space of Germany, the presence of these flags in itself is illegal. So hanging this flag outside or in any semi-public space can cause, can result into a six months uh, imprisonment. So how can it be present in such a thing as an alternative, uh, in this alternative parliament? Here it becomes, I think, interesting, is that we didn't organize the flags of these organizations in the parliament based on ideology or geographical location or anything else. Maybe you can best see it in this image, the first one. We organized the flags by color, creating what you could call an abstract color scheme. And thus, as an artist, it become, it, it's possible to argument that if at some level, the law would intervene and try to take out this flag of PKK, it means they destroy the abstraction of my artwork. As such, when they take out the flag, these flags become flags. They become illegal. In the moment that they are all placed together, they are part of one and the same abstraction. Of course, they are abstract, and at the same time, they are not. Uh, one of the first speakers of the New World Summit that Yunus in a moment will introduce Luis Yalandoni. His first statement when he spoke was, my name is Luis Yalandoni, he represented among others the New People's Army, and that's my flag. And he pointed out to his flag in this abstract color scheme. So what is interesting is that in art, in a way, this abstraction and the total opposite of it can exist at the same time. And it's this, this strange juridical limbo that the art exists in and that the, the so-called terrorists exist in, that can generate, I believe, an interesting coalition. It is exploring these gray zones of the juridical system through art that make it, make it possible to provide a political space to act upon democratic, the democratic promise that our politics is not capable of, but that our art is capable of, making it, making it possible to argument that today our art is potentially more political than our politics, in the sense that it's more capable of acting upon the promise of democracy than those who today claim that they are the sole representatives of democracy. I want to give very shortly the word to uh, Yunus Buadi. Yunus Buadi is a um, university researcher, um, an art collector, um, who has uh, worked as the producer and researcher of the New World Summit, meaning that he was the one who contacted these different organizations, spoke, uh, gained the trust of the different speakers, uh, and he will introduce just some of the speakers that were present at the summit, and afterwards I will do a very, give a very short closing uh, statement, and maybe there's a moment for some questions. So, Yunus, please. Hello. Um, well, we're talking about the monopoly of history, and I think one of the first things we need to address is actually what is a terrorist? Well, is, is there a definition of terrorism? Well, there actually is not a definition of terrorism. The, who is a terrorist is actually defined by the ones who have the monopoly of power, the monopoly of history. Uh, Jonas just mentioned that there are several lists. I will go pretty briefly through the different kind of lists. There's the UN list. It's passed in 1998 eight in the UN Security Council and the only two organizations that are on it are the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda. All, all UN member states have to apply to that list. So in every country in the world that's a UN member, they have a terrorist list. Some countries only apply to that list. Other countries have their own list. There's the European list, there's the American list. So how do you get on the list? Well, it's very unclear. Actually, the way that I found out how the list, the European list is working, and I will focus now just for the European list because we're in Europe, uh, was actually through American documents of their Foreign Affairs Committee, which was trying to get Hezbollah on the European list. They were trying to lobby to get Hezbollah on the list, but they were complaining that it was so difficult because the European procedure to get somebody on the list is completely untransparent. So even the Americans had no clue how they could get somebody on the list in Europe, even if they were trying really hard. And through these documents, I found out that the committee, it's located in Brussels, is coming together twice a year. Uh, they meet twice a year. There are no records of their proceedings. And uh, all member states in Europe have to agree. 
Then within Europe, there are actually two different kinds of lists. You have the lists that are of the organizations outside of Europe, such as the PKK. All European member states have to agree that they are a terrorist organization, but once they're on it, then it's, uh, it applies to all European member countries. But if it's a domestic or European terrorist organization, such as the IRA or the uh, ETA, then not all European countries have to apply to it. So even if you have a European uh, terrorist organization as the ETA, then they can still be legal in Germany. So that also gave us the space, to, for example, to have an... Uh, I will go through it. A um, uh, spokesperson of the political wing of the ETA, Batasuna, who is one of the peace negotiators, to be present in Berlin. Uh, well, then we're coming to the question of violence. Well, we assume that a terrorist is a violent person. Uh, well, that's apparently violence is just a requirement that we assume that has to do with terrorism. You don't even have to be violent to be labeled a terrorist. And I'll actually go now a little bit more in depth to one of the first speakers. She, and this is Nancy Hollander. She's an American lawyer. Uh, she has many clients who have been confronted with terrorist cases. Uh, a couple of her clients are in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, but she was talking on the New World Summit on the Holy Land Foundation. The Holy Land Foundation used to be the biggest Muslim charity organization of the U.S. They were, uh, had th several offers all across the U.S. Doing, were doing human, humanitarian relief work after disasters. But as their name said, Holy Land Foundation was mostly active in Palestine and more particularly in Gaza. Uh, they were providing schools and hospitals in Gaza, uh, but after 2011, uh, 2001, uh, September 11th, when the uh, tw attacks happened on the Twin Towers, uh, terrorist legislation became much stricter. Um, one of the consequences was that, that you could also immaterially support terrorists and by doing that become a terrorist organization yourself. But the very fact that the Holy Land Foundation was uh, providing schools and hospitals under control of Hamas, they were legitimizing Hamas in Gaza. And for that very fact, they were labeled as a terrorist organization and their leaders were sentenced for 65 years in prison. The monopoly of history. Uh, right now there's the conflict in Syria. They are called rebel fighters, the free uh, Syrian army. In other situations, when people fight for the self-determination, they're called, labeled terrorists. It's very unclear when this is happening, but mostly it has to do with geopolitical interest one one country. Uh, one geopolitical interest aligned that uh, uh, organization can be labeled as a terrorist organization. And this is the European spokesperson of the Turek rebels, Musa Ak Aserit. And in northern Mali, as you might know, there has been a rebellion. Uh, the Turek's took over two thirds of the country and, in this, and established their own independent state. Uh, since then, there have been a lot of calls to label them as a terrorist organization because they supposedly are cooperating with other so-called terrorist organizations. And as we speak, uh, the UN is deciding if there should be an intervention with the UN force to Mali. So it was actually quite interesting that we actually had a person, at this moment he's still a freedom fighter, maybe tomorrow he's officially a terrorist. Then we have Fadil Yidirim. She's from the Kurdish women's movement, and she is uh, based in, she is working on a feminist emancipatory struggle under the umbrella of the PKK. Uh, she has never actually committed any acts of violence. What she has done is trying to break the patriarchal society in Kurdistan because they actually are fighting two wars. One against the Kurdish, uh, Turkish government, who, who don't give them the rights that they are demanding. And secondly, the feudal system that's also still persistent in uh, Turkey, in the Kurdish areas. So it's a very patriarchal society, so they actually try to emancipate the women there as well. 
and then they will be in, become integrated into the PKK network. Uh, for her actions of emancip uh, emancipating women, making shelter houses for women who actually want to go from these feudal uh, situations, she got sentenced 10 years to prison because she was breaking uh, the rules of the Holy Family and Muslim society. I will go over one more. Louis Alandoni. Louis Alandoni is one of the spokespersons and co-founders of the New People's Army in the Philippines. In the Philippines, it has already been going on a struggle against imperialist powers from the late 19th century. Uh, in, these, in this war, millions of people have died and they are continuing this struggle against imperialist powers. Uh, the New People's Army was actually founded in the 60s and one of the more interesting characteristics of this organization is that they have uh, local assemblies and in these local assemblies they have de democratic structures which actually are more democratic than the Philippines themselves. They also have of one of the, as far as I know, one of the only listed terrorist organizations, they have gay marriage, which is not allowed in the Philippines themselves. So you see actually an organization that is striving for independence, a right of self-determination, which is more democratic than any of the countries that actually are putting them on the list. So this is a very short overview of the kind of organizations we have had, and if there are any more questions, we can answer them later. I love this duo uh, talk show, no? So, <clears throat> To summarize the presentation so far, I propose art in a dual function, the use of art, when it comes to the political use of art. First as an instrument to analyze, to map out and break what we've been discussing as democr democratism's monopolies. And I think the New World Summit is a good example of that because it, in, in, its, in its shape, it literally forms a supplement of those organizations, of those knowledge, of that knowledge, of those histories that today have no place in what we call democracy, what I call democratism. It literally maps out the field of histories of knowledge that is not supposed to enter into the public sphere. The second function of art is as a political instrument to shape new forms of public domain. New forms of public domain where we imagine, where we explore, and most of all, where we act upon the principles of fundamental democracy. Even though at one hand the parliament shows the limits of democracy, it at the same time tries to supplement it, tries to bring back into the public sphere what it has suppressed before and thereby at least making it possible to have a public space, to have a public platform, a shared platform, a radically dip diplomatic platform, one might say, where it becomes possible to discuss what this meaning of the promise, what the promise of democracy means today, the promise of a fundamental democracy. And it is from this political instrumentalization of art that I have tried to introduce today what I believe can be the basis for a history of art according to the resistance to begin. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I think um, th there are probably some questions. I mean, I th the whole, I really think it's, it's great how you, I thank you to you both, of course. Uh, it's really great how you, with your work, try to intervene, to understand and to intervene in the procedures of democracy and to show the limits of it. And I think also the differentiation between democracy and democratism is, uh, is very fruitful. So um, I would, we have maybe time for one or two questions. So please, does anybody? Um, yeah, I'm just curious how you managed to get people to Berlin. Uh, who were on a uh, terrorist watch list. Well, what uh, Yunus, I think, also explained is that 
the, <coughs> the, the, the different organizations on the international terrorist list have different statuses. So there can be the status, for example, of peace negotiations. Those that are engaged in peace negotiations, even though the organizations are placed on the international terrorist list, there are segments of the organization, spokesperson, who are moving in a kind of juridical gray zone and that are believed to contribute to a possible peaceful or more or less peaceful solution. There's other... Um, there's another aspect that I think is very important about the New World Summit, and that is that it's not tied geographically. Um, in, in, uh, we, as the New World Summit, don't represent any nation states, any properties, any specific interests other than that of exploring what potentially can be discussed as fundamental, perceived as, uh, understood as fundamental democracy. So, while moving the parliament through different countries, every different country has a different international terrorist list, meaning that sometimes organizations that are listed in one country are not listed in another, meaning that theoretically, if you would move around the world with this parliament, at the end you might have hosted most of these voices that in one country are excluded and the other are not, which also shows the incredible, incredible relative meaning of the concept of terrorism. I think um, one of the lawyers present who represented the Tamil Tigers among others, Victor Koppe, uh, made very clear that the, that the concept of terrorism, juridically speaking, has no meaning whatsoever. It's the same, it's a metaphor or it's an atmospheric description that I would not like you or I create an atmosphere around you that connects you to the feeling of violence or danger, or, but it has no uh, grounded juridical status. You want to add? Uh, yes, but me, me also, like more on a practical side, how do we get them? Well, that was actually not so easy because how do you contact them? Well, we tried first by mail, which of course did not work. I mean, like we were maybe quite naive, like, well, a lot of them have websites, so let's just write them a formal email and see how they react. Well, nobody reacted. And I think we sent more than 100 emails. And of course, they are very suspicious as well. They don't know who we are, how we, what we represent, how our alliances are. So actually I start going to obscure conferences over uh, Europe, see we're uh, meeting up with people, people <coughs> introduce me to other people, infiltrate it. In this whole process we also contacted the Dutch Secret Service to notify them about our project because I was a little bit actually afraid what will happen if I start contacting hundreds of terrorist organizations. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, the team of the Berlin Biennials forget fear, so I stuck with that motto and continued. And actually, the more I got to know about the system and how it was working, actually, how, uh, actually, then the fear actually started going away. But so actually, I got to know people. They introduced me to people, and then from that moment on, they uh, they go to conferences as well. They meet people. They have their network. So it was quite actually interesting that for them. Uh, even though some of them I contacted individually at different places, they still knew each other because they all are their experts in their fields. I mean, like all among us, we, quite, we have a good network here. They have their own network as well. They have their expertise and not, not necessarily on a violence level because these are really like the political representatives of these organizations and they know how to manage to uh, speak in public without getting in trouble because even if, if your organization is on an in, international terrorist list, you can still speak most of the time unless you're in jail for, because you have committed a terrorist organ crime. But as long as you're listed as an organization or as a person, quite often you can still speak. But you have to be very careful what you say and what, how you phrase it and also how we uh, provided the space for them to speak because if we would promote any kind of violent uh, acts of uh, terrorism, then we would be uh, committing a crime as well. So for us it was very clear that it's not about the violence. It's not about the justification of the violence. It's just about the process. How do you become? What? Who defines who you're a terrorist? And how do you actually get off the list? And who decides that? So that's. It. Well, well, I would suggest. I mean, anyway, I would uh, because uh, the next ones are waiting already. I would. I would really suggest to everybody. Uh, it was really an amazing project uh, to be and amazing to be at this uh, new world summit, and uh, and it, uh, really mind opening also. And I just advise everybody to take. Uh, advantage of both of you being here and uh, and uh, learn more about this because I think it, it touches on very many topics that we were talking here. So I, I just uh, advise you all to, to prolong this conversation uh, while, while you both are here. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.